those of you who have served our country in the military, I'd like for you to stand up just for a second and let us give you uh, an appreciation. Thank you. I didn't have a privilege of serving uh, in the armed forces, but I do have the privilege of serving you, and so hopefully that um, will uh, be meaningful. I'd like to introduce, or at least welcome to the podium, uh, Moses Harvin, who is a, a trustee with Eastern Florida State College, and he's going to do our introduction of our keynote speaker, and thank you for your kind attention. Good morning. Everybody's feeling all right this morning? <clears throat> it's a good day to be at the Eastern Florida State College, isn't it? It used to be the old BCC, but we're so excited about this new name. Uh, it's been really uh, been catching on, and we're truly, truly uh, are privileged to, to move forward in this new venture for the college. To uh, Dr. Ritchie, Jane Ritchie, president in his absence today, to my fellow trustees, students, and staff, especially good morning to my fellow veterans this morning. And many thanks to uh, the SBDC and the ROBS leadership uh, for hosting this wonderful event today. Uh, my task is to introduce this giant of a woman, um, one who paved the way for countless others along the way, whether it be male, female, veterans and non-veterans, this is truly <clears throat> a pace setter. She is truly living the American dream. President Obama's approach embodies the values and the ideas and the direction America must take to build a 21st century vision of the American dream in a nation shared with opportunities, shared with prosperity, and shared responsibility. Freedom is given, is never given. It is won. And freedom, as you know already, especially you veterans, is not free. So I'm excited today. And before I go any further, I'd like to acknowledge uh, a retired Colonel uh, David Branch. David, raise your hand. He he escorted the general here today, so good to see you, uh, David. And also want to recognize uh, Colonel Bobbitt. Colonel Bobbitt, raise your hand there this morning. And also another doctor, he's a doctor now, David, she was a colonel as well, Ms. Gibson. Would you raise your hand too as well this morning? So happy to be in the house to support this wonderful uh, general this morning. Major General Monsolet Harris, called Marcy Harris, was commissioned through the Offer Training School, Lakeland Air Force Base, Texas, in 1965. She had held various a variety of assignments, many of which resulted in the first for women in the Air Force. She was, first, she was the first woman aircraft mechanic officer, or ma uh, maintenance officer, one of the first two women air officers commanding at the U.S. Army, U.S., I won't say I'm Army, she's Air Force. See, I'm, I'm wearing my Air Force uh, blue tie this morning, as you can see. <clears throat> the U.S. Air Force Academy and the first woman deputy commander for maintenance. She also serves as the White House social aid during the, <clears throat> during the Carter administration. She is currently the CEO of two companies, Marsons and uh, Eroster uh, Government Services. General Harris was director of maintenance for the U.S. Army, U.S. Air Force. See, it's not a slip of the tongue for no reason, you know. She, <laughs> she was first uh, African-American Brigadier General, the first African-American Major General in the nation. Many awards and decorations include the Bronze Star. Two significant uh, uh, awards. Uh, she has many, many, many accolades, many, many awards, even as in her uh, second career today. But two significant awards that we want to mention today is the BET Black Girls Rock Trailblazer Award and the Legacy Award for, the, for Black Enterprise Magazine. Now, this is a close friend of mine. 
and um, we're on first name basis. Um, she called me Moses, I call her General. So, <laughs> so we, <laughs> so, so we uh, have this very, very close relationship and we're so happy this morning to, that she's in the house to share her story with you. And please ask questions because she's a wealth of knowledge and, and uh, uh, just, a, just one of these books that's walking around today that we need to tap into to, to learn more about what she, she, she's accomplished. This, so please join me in welcoming this great soldier, this great entrepreneur, General Marcy Harris. Thank you. Thank you very much. That just reminds me, when I used to go into my staff meetings, I saw there was a Marine general, and he was on one of 60 Minutes shows, and when he walked in, he'd tell his folks, sit down. So I did that one time at my meeting, they all looked at me like I was crazy. <laughs> so I'm going to tell you, I really enjoy that. Thank you so much, Moses, for introducing me. It's really great when a friend tells people who you are because he's telling it from his heart, because he is also my heart. Uh, and it's truly a pleasure for me to be here with you today, to be among people who are just like me, folks who serve their country, who are still ready to serve their country, and who also want to serve themselves by making their lives a little bit better. Back in 1965, when I started this journey of being an adult, I thought retirement meant you were old. <laughs> Whether you separated or you retired or however you got there, it all kind of, kind of came too quickly. But you found out, hey, I'm really not old yet. You know, it reminds me of a story of a, of a woman who, who was lamenting on her age. And she was going around just feeling sorry for herself, thinking about all the things about her body, especially that were making her look old and be old and live old. And one day she had an appointment with a, a dentist. And she, uh, when she went, let me catch my breath for a moment. <laughs> because I want to tell you about this lady. <laughs> she went and she saw that this is somebody that she knew. And she knew him in college. And she went in, she shook his hand, and she said, you know, we know each other. You were in one of my classes. And do you know what he said? This old, dilapidated, jaws dropping, eyes bulging with bags under them. This old, dilapidated gentleman turned to her and said, which class did you teach? <laughs> yeah. Well, that's one thing that you don't have to worry about is age. Have you ever heard people say age is nothing but a number? Yep, and they're right. And today, the age I am, there are only three numbers that I worry about. That's cholesterol, blood pressure, and sugar. <laughs> Even if you are in your 70s, you are young enough to start a new chapter in your book of life. The best part is that you bring talents to the table that were given to you by one of the greatest employers on this universe, and that's the United States military. Now let's talk about those talents for a minute. How many of you ever repaired a tank? Okay. How many of you ever, <laughs> David raised his hands. <laughs> He's army too. He, he, matter of fact, he was a tank driver who's repaired a few tanks. How many of you ever loaded bombs or missiles? All right. Now how many of you think the world out there is clamoring for tank mechanics or bomb loaders or missile loaders? You're right, nobody. But people are clamoring for the talents, the qualities, the principles, and the imagination that being a tank mechanic or a missile loader can bring. Let me tell you what I'm talking about by telling you what the military gave me and how I came about recognizing the codes that are driving me in civilian life. I have 10 codes that I live by. The first is never close a door on yourself. The second, be prepared to go through the door when it does open for you. Third, don't allow anyone to close that door on you. Persevere. Keep trying. Keep pushing. Like and believe in yourself. Even when the going gets rough, knowing that if you think it, if you think it, then it must be right. Number six, when the times come and things don't come together as you would have them, take 
time out, go ahead, feel sorry for yourself, and cry if you must. <laughs> this is one lesson I learned the hard way, and I learned it on the flight line in, in Thailand back during the Vietnam War. I was the kind of maintenance officer who wanted to have all of her planes flying. Every mission that came up, I wanted my planes to go in and fly. It never occurred to me that those planes would have to stay down for a while and go through some kind of a maintenance. Well, I had flown my planes and the folks let me fly my planes so much so that out of my 10 aircraft, all but two of them were grounded. Yeah, because <laughs> maintenance folks know what that meant. I was sitting on the corner of the flight line, feeling sorry for myself, sulking, and thinking all kinds of bad thoughts and trying to figure out how do I get out of this. I could not think of how to solve that situation. And to this day, I don't know how he found me, but the deputy commander for maintenance, Colonel Galpin, found me in my corner. Now let me remind you, I was the first woman aircraft maintenance officer and I'd just flown all my aircraft right into the ground. And this colonel slaunters over to me and in that colonel voice says, well, what are you gonna do about this little missy? Yeah, and my answer was, what? <laughs> I don't know. Well, he was so flustered, all he could do was pat me on the back and say, don't cry, don't cry. But you know what? That cry did it. Getting that cry and that self-pity out of the way helped me to come up with a solution. And I had all my planes back flying in a day and a half. Just remember, take that minute and get that pity out of the way. But you can't lick your wounds forever. Someone has got to fix the wrong, and that someone is you. So after your pity party, get up, face the problem, and think of a solution, and then apply it. Now number seven, to get things done by people, you need to like people. Therefore, you need to develop a respect for people and their opinions and their thoughts. Accept credit with grace when, a, when you deserve it, and give credit with a plume when appropriate. Praise in public, criticize in private. Bottom line though, is like what you are doing and believe that your task has merit. The best way to like what you're doing is to like what you do. When I entered Spelman College in Atlanta, Georgia, back in 1960, I not only enrolled in classes, I, along with some of my classmates, joined a movement that led, the students of the Atlanta led by students of the Atlanta University Center. It was the student movement for civil rights. My classmates and I were foot soldiers because we were just that. We were part of this little army that fought its battles on foot, picketing and, and boycotting and sitting in. It was well known that if you sat in, you were going to be arrested. The student leaders did not want you to get arrested unless you were at least 18 years of age. <laughs> I couldn't wait to be 18. In my naivete, I would rather go to jail than pick it. I wanted to make a statement. In January of 1961, I turned 18 and was well on my way to being arrested. But my father put a quick halt to that notion. I don't want you to sit around trying to figure out my age now by trying to add up 1961 and 18. So I'm just going to tell you, <laughs> I'm 70 years old. Okay, but I turned 18 right before the second semester of my freshman year. Well, I called my daddy. I'm a daddy's girl, you see. I called my daddy and I said, tomorrow, daddy, I'm going to be arrested. Even you, who are not old enough to have an 18-year-old child, can imagine his shock. We talked for an hour, and I don't remember everything that he said, but I remember his bottom line. There are some folks who open doors for people, but there have to be people ready to go through those doors when they do open. That was the first thing that I remember that could be called one of my life's lessons. Be ready. Be prepared to go through that door when it opens. That is just what you are doing right now. By attending this conference, you are preparing yourself to go through the door when it opens for you. Now, I later came to learn that you must recognize when a door is opening. 
I gained an appreciation for planning and for practicing and for activating through that student movement. I learned many of those lessons through that movement. Now, you've learned many of your lessons to your time in the Department of Defense. Preparing to go through the open door was actually the easy part. You go to school, you learn the subject matter, and you learn how to apply those lessons. The hard part is recognizing when a door opens. That whole participation as a foot soldier taught me a lot of things that were to pay off for me as I went through life, especially when I was a leader in a leadership position. Let me tell you about the first time that I recognized this lesson, recognizing when a door is opening. I'm gonna tell you what happened and how it paid off for me. In my senior year at Spelman, I was actively involved in the dramatic theater and had the opportunity to travel with Spelman, Morehouse, Atlanta University players. We toured Germany and France in November and December of 1963. We had performances in a play called Jamaica at several United Services organizations, USOs, on Army installations. Because of those two months away from school, I changed my major to speech and drama. You can imagine that there were not too many people in the civilian world looking for a woman at that age with a drama degree. So uh, no job seemed to exist for me at that time. Everyone wanted you to have some experience and they didn't want it in drama. One of my younger cousins happened to say one day that a friend of hers was going to join the army. <laughs> Sounded a little bit like a door opening for me. I needed experience and the services gave you experience. My last year at Spelman gave me the travel bug and I like traveling and the services sent you to exotic places. Add to that my desire to do something that made a difference. To top it off, the ladies who were the leaders at the USO wore blue. I like blue. <laughs> and so my brother had spent a short time in the Air Force, so I decided to join the Air Force instead of the Army. Now, have you ever done something then and questioned your decision? <laughs> well, the very first morning I was awakened at Officer Training School, OTS, at 5.30 in the morning, I was a lot like Goldie Hawn in that movie, Private Benjamin. I wanted that other Air Force. The one where you went to work at 8 o'clock, and the only difference between that Air Force and the civilian workforce was that you didn't have to decide what to wear in the morning. And it sure came as a big hard lesson to me that this was not the training to, for a position in the USO. Now, another lesson I learned from my father was to be true to your decision once you were committed and approach it with dedication and with purpose. So you know what I did? I decided that I was going to give it my best. When you put your mind to something, it can reap many benefits for you. This paid off for me in that during the second half of OTS, I became the deputy squadron commander for the WAF, that's the women in the Air Force, the WAF squadron. You know what else? I actually had fun. You might think it a little bit crazy having fun in boot camp, but when you see the value in your purpose, you can enjoy doing your work, and you can enjoy the people you're doing it with. I mentioned that one of my codes was liking people. You have been exposed to people from all walks of life, and the Department of Defense is a miniature model of the United States. America is a land of multiple races, multiple ethnic groups, multiple cultures, individuals with alternative lifestyles, and people who have different and varying opinions. It is apparent that our forefathers envisioned today's populist composition, but they coined the phrase, e pluribus unum, out of many, one. This is DOD. This is us, folks. We are those different and many people with those many cultures and ideologies. We are that nation that the framers of the Constitution envisioned. Regardless of your chosen field or the direction that you plan to take, you will be doing, what, doing it with people. You will either work with people, work for people, you'll have people as clients, and you will be encountering people every day. You are so fortunate to have been a part of the Department of Defense. My grandfather visited me when I was a captain working in the Pentagon. I took him to meet one of my generals. During the course of the conversation, he said, this is the smartest one of my grandchildren. 
she got herself a government job. <laughs> so I say too that you are smart. You are smart because you've had government jobs. Now this code I'm gonna talk about right now, this is perhaps my very favorite. It's perseverance. It wasn't until I had been in the Air Force for a few years that I realized that the philosophy of perseverance can reap many rewards. Perseverance led me to be an aircraft maintenance officer, thus becoming the first woman to be in that career field. I didn't become an aircraft maintenance officer to be the first woman to do it. I did it because another door opened. I was in Germany working as an administrative officer when the missile squadron that I was assigned to was disbanded. The deputy commander for materiel, Colonel Webb Thompson, asked me if I wanted to be an aircraft maintenance officer. True to my code, not closing the door on myself, and my code of going through the door when it opened, I said, sure, I would love to be one. I had no idea what it meant to be a maintenance officer. You know, it was just one of those, oh yeah, coach, put me in there, coach. Therefore, what he did is he made me a maintenance analysis officer. I won't say that the work was over my head or anything like that, but I couldn't understand what those folks were talking about. At least in admin, the people spoke the king's English. These maintenance people said things like cans, and they talked about late takeoffs and other things that made no sense at all to me. I not only didn't know what they were talking about, I didn't understand the significance of what they were saying. Then one day, Colonel Thompson asked me to do a study on the BLC. He said they were having too many aborts because of failures on the BLC. I said, yes, sir, and I promptly turned around, watched off, and asked my folks as soon as I got back to the office, what the hell is a BLC? You know, they told me it stood for boundary layer control, and it was heated air used to smooth the air over the wing of the F-4D fighter aircraft in order to assist with lift. Well, I told my people that we had to do a study on the BLC failures. I then turned around, promptly marched right back to Colonel Thompson's office and said that I needed to go to that aircraft maintenance officer course. This was a seven-month course at Chinook Air Force Base in Illinois, and you came out a well-educated aircraft maintenance officer. Colonel Thompson agreed, and I applied. I applied to the military personnel office in San Antonio, Texas, and they turned down my request. I replied, applied again. They turned down my request again. The last time that I retired, applied, I applied with a letter to the then Colonel Jean Holm, who was the director of the WAF directorate. We no longer have that directorate in the Air Force. Colonel Holm later became the first woman to be a general in the Air Force and the first woman to be a two-star general in the country. In six weeks, I heard from her with a class date. I also received a letter from the Military Personnel Center, which told me that the only way that women would be allowed into the aircraft maintenance career field was through cross-training, like I did. Perseverance. Opening that one door to this one all-male career field led to the demise of other all-male career fields. Opening so many doors for women, and they did not have to cross-train to get into those fields. I want you to see, people, that you don't have to close the door on yourself by saying, I don't know anything about doing that type of work. Don't close the door on yourself and don't allow anyone to close the door on you. Persevere, perseverance. If you take only one lesson away from the talk I'm having with you this morning, make it perseverance. Then you'll be three quarters of the way to your goal. Don't allow anyone to get away with denying you a start by asking you questions like, what can a bomb loader do for me in the hotel industry? You say, I don't know. I know you don't need a bomb loader. You need somebody who can get the job done and that's what I can do. By the time I graduated from that training course, the all, male, all, all the male offices in that career field had been over to Southeast Asia on two or more tours of duty during the Vietnam War. Since I was a captain, they made my orders to Saigon. Ladies out there, let me tell you something. We owe a lot to Colonel Thompson. 
He was tracking my matriculation through the training course and was made aware of my assignment to Saigon. He later told me that he was afraid that the deputy commander for maintenance at Tan Sanut Air Base in Saigon would not put me on the flight log. He was right. Colonel Thompson was the wing commander at Karat Royal Thai Air Base, and he had the military personnel center change my orders to go to Karat. The reason I said he was right was because the deputy commander for maintenance at Karat wouldn't put me on the flight line. The wing commander, his boss, asked him to twice, and twice he did not put me on the flight line. There was actually no third ask. He was told, put Marcy on the flight line. After being on that flight line for one month, I was hooked on the Air Force. I had made up my mind to make the Air Force a career. I figured out what the Air Force was. It was people, defense is people, civilian life is people dedicated people. I witnessed 17, 18, and 19 year olds prepare their aircraft for missions. They work together regardless of race or color. <laughs> I got to tell you this story about color, my little, my little girl. Uh, she was nine years old at the time, Tanisha. And we were having this conversation about color, and more specifically, color blindness. Well, I was explaining to her that there are some people who are colorblind and they can't distinguish colors uh, because they just cannot see the colors. I told her that Colonel, what's his name, was colorblind. And in that sweet little girl voice, in a shocked way, she turned to me and she said, you mean he doesn't know I'm black? 75% <laughs> of the missions, fighter missions, uh, during that Vietnam War were flown out of Thailand. Therefore, you can imagine that these young crew chiefs were busy like beavers. In a lot of ways, they were still teenagers, but when it came to strapping the pilot into their aircraft, they were serious. But all was not rosy for me on the flight line. I'm gonna tell you about my first six weeks. Now, Colonel Thompson tried to stack the deck in my favor. He had them put me in a well-honed, well-oiled squadron that could probably make no failures at all. My late husband was fond of saying that I could kill plastic flowers. I would say if he was with me back then, he would have jinxed me because that squadron started not meeting its mission requirements, its takeoff times or any other measure of success. So I thought that my senior NCOs were trying to run me off the flight line. Every morning, we met with the squadron commander, who was a lieutenant colonel and my boss. I don't know how things are organized now, but then the aircraft belonged to the flying squadron, and so did the men and this one woman belong to the flying squadrons. Well, at one of those meetings with the squadron commander, an event occurred that endeared me to my boss. In the meeting were the squadron commander, the operations officer, my senior NCOs, and me. I told my senior, senior NCOs right there in front of those two lieutenant colonels that the squadron was not living up nor pulling its weight on performing the assigned missions. I told them that the fault lay with maintenance. I further told them that, I, that they had decided, if they had decided, not to put their best effort forward because I was a woman and they didn't want me on the flight line, they better get over it. I told them I was there, and I was going to be there, and I was going to stay there. I was going to direct this maintenance effort even if I ran it into the ground. I said that I wasn't going anywhere, and if they could not work for me, then we would find them a different place to work. I went on to say that if they wanted to move, let us know right then and there. Well, every one of them said they wanted to be where they were and that they wanted to work with me. As I was leaving, uh, as everyone left, the squadron commander asked me to stay. <laughs> he told me that the next time I decided I wanted to do something like that, that I should talk with him first. <laughs> it never dawned on me that I would need his help in getting them moved had they not wanted to work for me. Not one time did I ever think I was gonna be leaving that flight line. Believe in yourself and have confidence that you can handle whatever situation comes your way. At any rate, the squadron came out of the doldrums and performed brilliantly. So much so that I was given a bronze star for my tour of duty on that flight line. There were several more times that I became the first woman to do a job. One of the first two women to be commanders of a cadet squadron at the Air Force Academy. 
the first woman deputy commander for maintenance, the first woman to be an Air Force's de director of tra technical training, and the first woman to be the Air Force's director of maintenance, to name a few. Becoming the first wasn't a goal of mine. It just happened. Like being the highest ranking woman in the Air Force, all of that just happened because I was around. And it also just happened because of the lessons that I learned away, along the way. Now I'm gonna stop talking about myself for a little bit and see if I can sum things up because I want you to have a chance to, to ask me some questions. The things that I did can be done by anyone. I didn't succeed because I was the first woman to do it. Rather because of the way that I approached and did each job that I was given. I became a success and was moved to more areas of responsibility by achieving excellence in the assignments I was in. The way I approached a new and unfamiliar job helped me to be successful. I didn't dislike a job, no matter whether it deserved it not to be liked. I didn't dislike a job, no matter what it entailed or who was trying to make life hard for me. I believed in myself, and that is what you need to do. I believed that excellence is the key to success, and you can achieve excellence too. Find out what personifies excellence in your career choice and mark those qualities that show you are achieving that excellence. Apply yourself, persevere, believe in yourself, and believe in your goal. Keep those doors opening and stay ready to go through them when they open in front of you. Yeah, yeah, some of it is luck. But remember that luck is when opportunity meets preparation. Some of it also depends on who you know. But you will never get to know the people who can open doors for you if you don't achieve excellence where you are. Believing in yourself, preparation, perseverance, giving powderbacks and pat your own back and for heaven's sake, keep opening doors. This is a formula that anyone can follow. The bottom line and above all, be yourself and live the way you know you must live. Thank you. Now, I want to open it for questions and then when I get off the stage, you can applaud me big time. <laughs> Anybody have any questions? Ah, come on. I can't believe all those veterans out there just heard a woman say that she liked every job she had. And you don't, you don't even want to know why or how or if it was true. You want to know how I did it? Yeah, yeah, how did I do it? You know what I do? I go and read up on everything that pertained to that job. Especially when you're in the service, you got all these regulations that you can read and follow. And I just kind of pick up and find out what was key in those, in those regulations. Some of the jobs were just plain dull. So dull that, a matter of fact, on one of them, I was able to read Gone with the Wind. <laughs> the reason it was dull, because I had prepared myself so well that I knew things that had to be done. And that's what I say to you, is prepare yourself. Get ready. Anybody else uh, got a question? That was my question. Yes, that's a question. Um, during your uh, career uh, progression, if you had to change one thing, what would it be? Oh, that's a good one. I love that question because I haven't got the answer right on the top of my head. Let me think for a minute. What would I be if I had to change any one thing? Oh, I think if I had the, the capability of changing it, it would be perhaps the assignment system. Uh, it, it, it offered you a chance to say where you wanted and what you wanted to go, where you wanted to be and what you wanted. Uh, but, and only probably about 70% of the time it was able to fulfill your request. So if I could, I'd change the assignment system to what? I have no idea, but that's one thing I would change. Anybody else? Yes. How will you apply your career in the military uh, with your entrepreneur <laughs> time today? How will it go? Well, again, it's, it's finding out what it is that I want to do. My thing is right now, uh, uh, my job primarily is uh, applying for government contracts. I've been to small business uh, development uh, seminars and conferences, just as you're doing. I got myself ready. I also found myself a partner in civilian life who was familiar with getting contracts and doing that. So those are the two primary things I would do. I'd study, 
and I find some individual who is keen on what it is I'm trying to be and where I'm trying to go. The other part is I would concentrate well on doing the job, the contract that I have. I believe in doing what the customer wants you to do. As long as it's legal, doing what the customer wants you to do. So make it kind of clear in both your minds that you understand what is expected of you. And then you can apply, and then you can figure out how to give it to that customer. Y yes? How did you uh, balance your career and your family with both your entrepreneurship and your military career? Uh, liking people had a lot to do with that. I, uh, I'm, I make friends easy, Lee. Is that the right way, Stanner? Easy or easily? <laughs> I make friends. And it's important to make the right kinds of friends. I had assignments that were overseas, and I had a two-year-old daughter at the time, and I was there by myself. Friends volunteered when I had to go on TDYs, uh, awful missions, uh, to t keep my child for me. The other part was I had family that supported me. And I kept my family highly informed on where I was, what I was doing, and what was involved. And I recognized that that child was also part of their family, and I wanted to keep them safe in their minds. They would come to my rescue. I uh, was tried a couple of times, and by that I meant I was challenged to see if I could respond. Uh, when my daughter was uh, nine, and this conversation happened, <laughs> We happened to be the two of us. My late husband uh, was off in law school, so it was just the two of us, and I was a single parent then. My boss all of a sudden said, this afternoon, I was in Oklahoma, and he said, this afternoon, we're going to go to California. Well, I, I didn't take it as a test right then, and I saw later that that's probably what it was, to see if me as a single parent could handle that. Well, he just didn't happen to know it, but my mother was living with me at the time. So I just went home, packed a bag, and said, Mom, I'm off to California. I later learned, and I learned quickly, that I needed to find somebody that I can call on in the spur of the moment. And I did. I uh, formed a friendship with a young lady who lived in Oklahoma, and we're still friends to this day, who I could call up in the middle of the day and say, Regina, I have a trip tomorrow. Can you pack your bags and be over here to stay with my child? She was just nine and couldn't stay by herself and get to school. Later in life, uh, when she became a teenager and was able to drive especially, it was no problem. But every assignment I had after that, I would also, the first thing I did was to find somebody who was going to be able and creditable, be able to take care of my daughter when I went away on jobs. Okay, yes. As a, uh, as a business owner, what's been the most difficult lesson uh, you've had to learn? How to stop being a general. <laughs> the civilians just don't obey well. <laughs> no. No, I, I had to learn that people, people have opinions. That's, and that I, I, and I say that's one of the lessons that I, I like, I like people, and that you have to value other people's opinions. And so that really comes home to me when being in a, uh, in a civilian world and trying to, to, to get started again in life. And that's what you're doing, you're starting all over again, but you're starting all over again with some value, with uh, some value that you learn along the way to get you to this point. Use those. Use them and apply them well. Figure out what they are. You know, if you don't do anything, just maybe sit down and write like I did. Say, what did I learn in the military that can be applied anywhere and can be applied by anyone? What are those values and those qualities? Sit down, figure out what they are that you know, and then you know how to apply them. Okay, uh, well, uh, Bob is telling me that I can get my applause now and get off the stage. <laughs> Thank you very much. I had a question. 
The question to the general, which you could answer later, is uh, I wanted a story about when you said no. Because oh, okay. um, a lot of achieving uh, people come across as, hey, I'll do anything. But you know, saying no sometimes is hard, too.